I'm Evelyn Kalb, interviewing her. Welcome to Evie's History Bites, hosted by Martha Owen, the Heritage Collection Manager at the Evelyn Lehman Kalb Heritage Collection at the Napanee Center. Welcome to another episode of Evie's History Bites. If you're new to the podcast, I'm Martha. And if you've listened before, welcome back. We have a great episode for you. It's about folk artist Emma Schrock. I have art collector Doug Grant and Emma's niece, Alita Schrock, sitting down with me to talk more about Emma. But before we get to them, let's learn a little bit more about Emma with a history lesson. Emma Schrock could be thought of as the Grandma Moses of Elkhart County and even Northern Indiana. She grew up Old Order Mennonite and started painting in her 40s. It is thought that during her career that she painted over 2,000 paintings. She was born with physical challenges and she never let those define her. In 1961, her sister-in-law, Irene Schrock, gave her Connie Gordon's You Can Paint a Picture book. Emma experimented with the book's techniques and she started her artistic adventures and the art that made her famous. She loved to paint landscapes but painted scenes directly out of her experiences. Schrock once said, I live what I paint and I paint what I see. Emma's first attempt at exhibiting and selling her work outside of her home came in 1965 at the Pletcher Village Art Festival, which is later known as the Amish Acres Arts and Crafts Festival in downtown Napanee. Emma's first solo exhibit was in 1979 at the Midwest Museum of American Art in Elkhart, Indiana. Emma's work can now be found at the Midwest Museum of Art Um, of American Art, Goshen College, as well as the Mathers Museum of World Cultures in Bloomington, Indiana. The Nabney Center also owns a large collection of Emma's work that are on display along with other informational panels and things about Emma. Mr. Grant joined me in the newly minted Doug Grant Family Gallery in the Napanee Center to talk about his love of art and collecting it. All right, so tell us a little bit about yourself. Um, I was born in Elkhart, Indiana. Uh, Went through school there. Uh, Went away to uh, college. Uh, I had a... um, I had a kind of an unusual set of scholarships that allowed me to go to any of 57 colleges and uh, I ended up going undergrad at the University of New Mexico. Why? I don't know because I was enrolled at other places uh, before that. But uh, I did uh, my undergraduate work at New Mexico and uh, I came out of there with a uh, a commission in the uh, Department of the Navy. Uh, they thought I'd be a, uh, a uh, naval officer, but they uh, were willing to take about 5% of us and give us a commission in the Marine Corps. And that was uh, a challenge, so I elected to uh, take my commission in the Marine Corps. Uh, that uh, took about four years to finish that. Um, When I uh, was finishing that up, I realized that uh, I better go back and get some education because nobody knew where New Mexico was. And uh, I didn't mention I was enrolled to go to Yale before that. I didn't know where Yale was, so I canceled Yale to go to New Mexico. Might not have been the best thing I ever did. But uh, I uh, um, decided to... uh, look at the different graduate schools. At that time, there were only about eight or nine graduate business schools in the country that were two years. And those were uh, Wharton, Harvard, Michigan, Stanford, those things like that. And uh, I uh, elected, uh, my first choice was uh, Wharton. And uh, I applied and got in there, and then I just quit there. So uh, Wharton's part of the University of Pennsylvania. And I thought that'd be a nice balance with uh, New Mexico. Nobody will know where that is in Philadelphia either. But uh, so I did uh, my two years at Wharton. Uh, then it was time to go to work. By that time, I was married. Uh, I had two children. And uh, we debated on what to do. We decided it'd be nice to uh, get into foreign work. And so the, the, 
the ideal kind of job for my kind of guy coming out of graduate school back at that time was to go into uh, international banking or uh, 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 investing, international investing. And I thought I was a little better cut out for the uh, banking uh, side of it. Uh, so uh, I interviewed with the, I uh, uh, was going to interview with the foreign banks. Uh, the United States just had one that was head and shoulders of all the others. This was back in the, uh, the early years. And uh, that was a bank called uh, uh, First National Bank in New York, which is now known as Citibank. Uh, the other big uh, American banks that were getting into it were uh, Chase, and Bank of uh, Bank of America, and uh, so uh, I was really lucky because everybody coming out of school at that time wanted to go into this international banking set, and uh, I was lucky to to get hired. And uh, you do your first few years normally in New York. Uh, and I had only been there a few year, uh, a few months. They called me in and they said, uh, we understand because you know a little Portuguese, you want to go to Brazil. And I said, well, yes. They said, well, that's, uh, you'll be here in New York three years, but uh, uh, we have an opening uh, coming up in a few months in Singapore. And if you're willing to go there, you'll be out of here in a little less than a year. And I told them, well, that's for me. Uh, and... Uh, I took that, and uh, so about 11 months into the flight, uh, flight from Wall Street where I was, I was uh, uh, sent with my family uh, to Singapore and uh, worked there for a better part of a year uh, when I was further assigned to uh, India. And uh, that was one of our biggest operations in all of Asia, in Bombay. We'd been there for... 60 years. I was in uh, Bombay about a year uh, with a family. Kids went to a uh, British school uh, and then they decided to expand. International banking was expanding at that time and uh, they wanted to open a bank in South India which was known as, we'd know it as Madras. I went down to Madras and opened a bank for Citibank. That was like their, only their third bank in India. Uh, and they built a lot more, but uh, uh, toward the uh, end of what would have been a first tour, my daughter uh, caught polio, and um, she'd had the salt and the sabin, but they thought this was some other strain. And so uh, after a year or so, uh, they suggested I could get better, better medical attention if we uh, transferred to Hong Kong. And that, uh, that was not hard to uh, agree to. Um, so I was assigned to Hong Kong, which was uh, one of the main banking centers of, of the world, and uh, worked out uh, in Hong Kong uh, for a couple of years. By, uh, by that time, I'd been, uh, I think I'd been married since 54 to 6 I'd been married about 11 years. I'd been, we'd moved about 14 times. And uh, we said, that's about enough. So I uh, re resigned from the bank uh, to take a job where I could be in a permanent place longer. And I, was, uh, I didn't realize I was kind of a rare animal uh, uh, because St. Lawrence Seaway had opened up. Every bank on the Great Lakes was looking for, for people who were in foreign banking. And I thought I was going to go there, but the... Uh, bank in Elkhart uh, recruited me and I uh, decided to stay in my hometown and uh, took a job with what was in the St. Joe Valley Bank and I was the uh, uh, I was a director and executive vice president there for uh, a number of years. Oh, so how did you get interested in collecting art? Well, uh, when uh, when we worked in Asia, you could tell I spent about six years out in Asia. Mm -hmm. We didn't have any money, but uh, you could go around to these so-called flea markets and places in Asia and 
buy stuff that I thought was just astounding for not a lot of money. Uh, I thought they were astounding. Probably my uh, my judgment of what was astounding wasn't as good then as it might be now. Uh, and we started we started picking up a few things uh, when. I, uh, I had resigned and I'd come back to the uh, States and took the job in Elkhart. Um, I uh, took up golf and tennis and I uh, figure I mastered those in a few years so I took up antique collecting, I, which I could certainly did better than my golfing. but. Uh, Got a, we had a lot of fun going around. At that time, every little town had three or four antique shops, and there were big malls and all that kind of stuff that people, younger people today, can't can't imagine. Imagine, and uh, started buying antiques and sticking them around the house, and kind of gravitated into uh, uh, ceramics. And it didn't take very long to buy a pot on every table in the house. And then it was two pots on every table, and it was three pots on every table. And whoa, uh, I discovered they made a ceramic pot that they called a wall pocket. And that was uh, a uh, pot that had a flat back. You mm -hmm. nailed, put a nail in the hall, in the wall, and you hung this uh, ceramic pot to it. And all the major uh, ceramic companies. Uh, generally made some wall pockets to go with their round pots. So I started uh, buying a few of those. There's a lot of them out there. <laughs> uh, there were over the recent history, the last hundred and some years in the United States, there were hundreds of ceramic companies. They are a great thing that everybody felt they had a little clay in their backyard and they could make some pots. It, most of them lasted about two years. Uh, I started collecting the wall pockets from those companies uh, that uh, had a reputation for the artwork and the individualism in them. And I only uh, tried to buy those from the uh, ones that were recognized as the better companies. And lots of it, there were lots, hundreds or thousands of individual potters in the United States, and I couldn't get into those, so I didn't buy any of those, although a lot of them did some fine fine work. Mm -hmm. uh, I uh, started buying wall pockets. For example, right now I have, uh, I have the collection. I don't want to be immodest, but I have the collection that exists in the country. Uh, I have a thousand wall pockets, roughly. Uh, the three major uh, pottery makers going back to the early part of the 20th century was Rookwood was determined to be the Cadillac and then um, uh, Weller and Roseville also made lots of them. Out of the thousand wall pockets I have that probably would cover 600 of them. Uh, the rest of the I probably collected from another 25 different companies that fill out the last 400. Mm -hmm. um, those uh, are uh, hanging all over our house and they uh, almost pre preclude uh, putting up uh, 70 Emma Shrocks, but I had them squeezed in there before. <laughs> yeah. Now it looks like the house is bare uh, uh. You know, with only a thousand wall pockets and <laughs> the, the, others, the other stuff. Mm -hmm. So uh, I, I, I gravitated and we gravitated into collecting a lot of stuff. Uh, mm -hmm. I, don't, I hope your next question isn't why. <laughs> um, but uh, we, uh, we, were, we were accumulators. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we, we, did the wall pocket, uh, we did the wall pocket thing. Um, uh, so I know you also had a collection of Overbeck pottery. So what, what is Overbeck? Well, Overbeck is, uh, was, a, was a sidebar coming out of my, our interest in American ceramics. 
in Indiana uh, had a number of potteries, but they had only one that I'd consider in the top five or six of America out of the hundreds, and that was a company called Overbeck, and that was in uh, Cambridge City, Indiana, and it was essentially run by uh, uh, some sisters. Four of the sisters did most of the uh, uh, pottery making, so we'll call it a company. And it was started in about 1910 or 1911. Uh, these were all uh, 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 old maid uh, uh, sisters. Uh, they had a fifth sister who got married and they shunned her for a few years until she got rid of her husband and then she could <laughs> come back and keep house. <laughs> But uh, uh, there were these four gals, and they had all been to the most elite art sculpting schools in America and taken courses, and then they all returned to Cambridge City and got into uh, making Overbeck pottery. And they made uh, some of the fi finest pottery made in this country for, oh, a couple of them died there in the, uh, about the 30s, one of them lived on to be 55, and kept Mary Frances that was, and she kept doing things on her on her own. Uh, so anyway, I got into doing Overbeck pottery because it was from Indiana, and uh, so many of these things, like the wall pockets and the Overbeck, I got in it when you could go around to these dozens of uh, antique shops and malls and. They had this stuff in there. Most of the people didn't know what they had, and you could buy this stuff up for a few dollars. And literally, some of it now is uh, gone to triple digits or more on something. You know, I, mm -hmm. if I'd have done more of that, I wouldn't have had to have a retirement account. I guess. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I have. We have all these wall pockets uh, at home, and. Uh, the uh, Overbeck, um, I gave about, tw most of it, I gave about 20 years to the uh, Midwest Museum of American Art uh, in Elkhart. And they, uh, there's a gallery there, and uh, we gave them about, uh, must be about five or 600 pieces of it, and it's some of the strongest pieces that they ever made. Uh, that's what happens when you, uh, uh, instead of buying CDs, you buy Overbeck for Fifty years, you, you, get, <laughs> yeah. you get a lot of the stuff, and so we are in. I don't know if you noticed this or not, but we put up the letters yesterday of the Doug Grant Family Gallery Emma Shock Collection, um, and we're we're in a room of Emma Shocks. So um, why? What was your interest in Emma Shock paintings, and um, why collect so many? Well, I hadn't thought of that in detail until you asked me to talk this morning. Uh -huh. uh, I think I first came across Emma Schrock when I got back to this country in 65. That happened to be coincidentally when Emma started painting. Uh, she's, uh, her earliest pictures are dated uh, right around uh, 1965. My memory tells me, and my memory is not as good as it used to be, was uh, when I was working in the building that was uh, the old uh, St. Joe Valley Bank, which is the uh, Midwest Museum now, uh, was the Hotel Elkhart, was across the street. They had a coffee shop on the main floor. And scattered around that coffee shop were these uh, little uh, pictures uh, done by, primitive pictures that were done by Emma Schrock. I, my recollection, that's about the first time I ever saw him. Well, she couldn't have been making them for very long at that time. And I started uh, picking up uh, a few of them then. And uh, that went on uh, the rest of my life. Uh, um, and uh, I ended up with... Uh, uh, in this exhibit, I guess we've got close to 70 or something like that. Mm -hmm. And everything I had, I've, uh, I've given to this museum, except seven of them I've kept at home, which uh, um, 
will will co will come here if uh, if you guys want them uh, on my demise. Yeah. Okay. Um, there was uh, why uh, it was because they were local again. Uh, you know, she lived there between Walkerusa and Napanee, and uh, it, it, collecting was. Uh, was something was obviously was interested to me, as you can see, that anybody would go out and spend their life gathering up a thousand wall pockets and <laughs> 70 or 80 and 90 Amish rocks, maybe should take up golf again. <laughs> uh, so, so tell us what led to wanting to find a new home for your Emma collection. Well, I think the what really eventually dawned on me when you get to be my age is you realize you're not going to live forever, and so what do you want? What do you want to have have happen to some of the stuff you've treasured the most? And uh, I've got I've had, uh, six or eight kids, depending on how you count them, and I know that's confusing, and uh, sixteen or seventeen grandkids and all that, and. Um, I thought it'd be a disservice to divide those up 10 or 12 or 15 different ways. And uh, on the Emma Schrocks, uh, I uh, was uh, talking to uh, Mr. Pletcher one day about that. And he called me back very quickly and told me he had a solution. <laughs> and that was to put them here in Napanee and uh, do a gallery for them. So, um, and I thought that was splendid because uh, I had a lot of places and museums around the state and even out of state uh, that would like some of this stuff. But uh, as you know, museums, 90% uh, of what they own is in storage and only they're only showing 10% at the time. And I uh, found it really uh, inviting to find somebody that was willing to put them on display full time. Mm -hmm. and locally, so the, that was a decision maker for me. Yeah. Nice. Mm -hmm. um, so did you happen to know Emma Schrock? No, I never met her. Uh, my wife uh, went out and uh, met her a couple of times. Uh, I wish I would have. Uh, uh, one time, I remember she went out, uh, there was a, pa a painting, kind of a snow scene, didn't have much in it at all. It'd be It'd be here in the museum somewhere, mm -hmm. and uh, it didn't have enough stuff in it. <laughs> and uh, she went out to Emma and said, Emma, you know, this is, doesn't have much Amish stuff in it. So she got Emma to paint a couple of Amish people and maybe a squirrel or two uh, in it. So uh, it turned it into a more of a traditional uh, Amish uh, picture. You I, know? I, think, I think it's the one that's right behind you. Okay. So... I'll take your word for it. Because <laughs> <laughs> there's a squirrel, there's a squirrel in there. Well, that, well that'd be it. Yeah, yeah. We, haven't, we haven't got too many squirrels. No, yeah. there's not too many squirrels. I read something that there's a, in a lot of them, there's a common dog in them that oh, she used. And okay. the dog's name was Spot. Well, and I noticed that winter scene behind you, that hasn't got much that indicates what we were talking about. A couple, no, of, a couple of deers in a log cabin. Yeah, yeah. he's... The guy's actually holding a gun. Well, no, and the, so that the, that denotes probably an early one, as you notice. Uh, she dated her stuff uh, after 1965, which she dated. Mm -hmm. She, I don't know of anything she dated until 1980. So you've got about 15 years in there uh, that there she signed them, but she didn't date them. Mm -hmm. Then starting in 80, you'll find dates uh, running up till the early 90s when she uh, when she died. Um, so I know that you've made other contributions in Elkhart County, um, but what are some of those contributions that you've made? Well, I'm kind of into material things, as you can uh, hear, and, uh, mm -hmm. and I've been a collector, and uh, this Emma Schrock collection has had a lifetime worth of fun putting this together. I've had a lifetime worth of fun... Uh, uh, collecting wall pockets. I mean, it's amazing when you're a collector how many miles, uh, hundreds of miles you'll drive to look at a wall pocket and get there, mm -hmm. it ain't quite what you thought it was, and <laughs> so you don't get it. 
but to uh, um, to collect a, uh, a thousand of them, you, you've got to have uh, you got to have a screw loose somewhere or a dedication. Uh, the other thing that I collected a lot of was uh, Overbeck. Uh, all of these things have gone to uh, collection. So, well, yeah, the Wellfield. They uh, got a. Uh, I had a, uh, I have an affection for the Wellfield because I cl still claim I was their first employee. I worked there two summers when I was in high school as part of the water company, and it was a jungle right out to the sidewalk. Uh, so when they uh, started developing that as a, a Wellfield botanical garden, uh, uh, I got involved and uh, I wanted to put something on that little island out there in the middle, and they said, no, we're just reserving that, that's nice, and, and uh, uh, they talked me into doing a uh, elk at the end of the one of the ponds. Uh, uh, that was fine until they weakened uh, a few years ago, and I had mentioned that I had tried to do something on the island, and we came to a mutual understanding that maybe we could do a buffalo out there because there were a lot of buffalo in this region, if you read your history. Mm -hmm. So we did a buffalo out on the island in the well field, and then a couple of years later, uh, they thought they'd like another buffalo. So we just got another buffalo in a few months ago, and uh, heaven forbid, I think, Maybe mom buffalo is with child because they, there may be the need for a little buffalo eventually. We'll, we'll handle that when it comes. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. I, I, enjoy, I enjoy speaking with you. Well, thank you so much for uh, doing this with me. I really, really appreciate it. So a little side note about Mr. Grant. Following his tenure at the St. Joseph Valley Bank, Mr. Grant served for many years as the CEO and chairman of the board of Lake City Bank that's headquartered in Warsaw, Indiana. In addition to the donation of his entire Emma Schrock painting collection, the Grant family provided the financial resources to create the gallery space and expand the Napanee cartoonist exhibit. This project has transformed the heart of the Napanee Center into an inspirational testament to artistic creativity. This project involved new gallery floors, lighting, walls, display panels, artifacts, and even interactive televisions. The bronze statues in the Wellfield Botanical Gardens that's talked about are larger than life, and they were created by a sculptor in Big Fork, Montana. The acquisition of the Emma Schrock collection sparked several related projects. The new Napanee Arts Center is in part due to its initial consideration as a site for the gallery. It's also given the Napanee cartoonist a deserving exhibit. It's John grants and gifts to this project, and it set in motion the restoration of the John Hartman House that's attached to the Napanee Center. Through the grants donation of the recently acquired Coppas Dining Room Suite that graced the Frank Coppas home for over 140 years. Alita Schock joined me to talk about her memories of her Aunt Emma. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Um, I'm Alita Schrock, and um, Emma is my aunt. Um, she was 39 when I was born, and for my two brothers and me, she was the heart and soul of Gristadi's place. Um, Gristadi and Gristmale is what we called my grandparents. The actual German pronunciation would be Gross Dottie and Gross Mommy, which Gross is like great, big, grand. And, um, but in Pennsylvania Dutch, we just said Gris Mame and Gris Dade. And, um, but my brothers and I actually referred to them as Emma Gristades in order to differentiate from my maternal grandparents. And, and my maternal grandparents were Dorothy Gris Mames because my mom was the oldest of 11. And so my youngest aunt was just a couple years older than my brother and I. So she was our playmate. And so by the same token, Emma was the person we interacted with most at Emma Gristadis, and that's why we called her that. Um, my aunt and cousins um, lived just across the road from Gristadis, and then we lived like about a quarter of a mile down the road, so we were constantly back and forth. My um, Gristadis place was almost kind of like a second home for us. 
and um, my, it was my grandmommy and my aunt Emma who really were there most of the time and really made it what seemed like home and my um, grandpa was there too but by that time he was older and so he kind of slept on the couch a lot at that time and my aunt Miriam was also a little person mm-hmm. and but she was able to work outside of the home so she wasn't there as much so that's pretty much why Emma and Gers mommy were the main people there um, I was recently talking to my older brother um, about Gerstadis and he expressed the same thing that I did that their place really was a place that just felt like at home where we felt loved and accepted and it's like you know it's real because my older brother was like ADHD um, undiagnosed but you um, really mega ADHD as a kid and so kids like that don't always feel as loved and accepted and he felt that there so um, it was it was cool it's when I think back at to it I I really miss that feeling of of home that we had there um, my dad was the baby of the family and Emma was almost 15 when he was born so she kind of helped raise him mm-hmm. and I um, Also, my dad was diagnosed with cancer, Hodgkin's disease, um, just shortly after I was born. And my, um, so then he passed away when I was four years old. And so I think um, he was, you know, partly Emma's baby. And so he was special to her. And I think that's partly what made us very special to her also. But in reality, all of our nieces, of her nieces and nephews were special to her because she Um, when I read her diaries she writes about like the, my older cousins they were her first nieces and nephews and you can just tell how much she loves them and then the youngest one of my um, aunt and uncle's family were the three little girls is what she would refer to them as and you can still feel the love for them in her writing and then my other aunt and uncle weren't able to have children and so they adopted a boy and girl and you can again just feel the love that Emma had and Older Mennonite culture is not really expressive of their emotions, but so Emma didn't write specifically about her love, but yet you could you could feel it mm-hmm. in it. Um, and all of us cousins took turns um, mowing um, Gerstin and Gers mommy's yard, and we helped like drive the horse and buggy, you know, as they got older and weren't able to do it for themselves. and So just being up there, we were like a natural part of Emma's life, of my grandparents' life. And um, my dad had started a business, and he called it Schrock Small Engine. And well, the name is kind of self-explanatory, repaired, you know, small engines, lawnmowers, and things like that. And after he had cancer for several years, he asked my mom, so when I'm gone, are you going to take over? And her first response was like, "Oh no, I couldn't." And he just said, "You can if you want to." And that confidence that he placed in her helped her. So I grew up in a somewhat atypical older Mennonite family because it was a single parent, and my mom was well back in the 1960s making her own way in a man's world mm-hmm. and um, and but I'm a teacher ever since fourth grade I just knew I wanted to be a teacher and so when I was 19 I moved to Ohio and I taught in an older Mennonite school there grades um, one through six for the first years and then um, I had um, one through four and seventh and eighth grade for um, a, cu- uh, a couple years too and um, my I just I loved it there it, w- it was awesome my very first day of teaching I The three oldest boys, uh, sixth graders, came running in at recess with this dead skin and dangled it in my face. And so I just kind of, without thinking, grabbed it and chased them outside around the school. And um, they were my best friends. They never had any problems of them. Um, but when I was 22, I decided to leave the Old Order Mennonites. And um, I went to college and got my degree in elementary education. So I've been... Um, teaching in South, the South Bend schools for 30 years now. Okay. And, um, but I also later got my master's in creative, uh, non-fiction creative writing. So um, currently I'm reading Emma's diaries again, and I'm actually 
trying to take all these pictures and writing what Emma's experiences would have been with what the, what's in the pictures, you know, her life experiences and how it mm-hmm. relates to her. So, um, like all these things of corn huskings and and um, going to church, riding in the horse and buggy, they're just her everyday experiences. So, um, but for relaxation for myself, I, I love nature, I love gardening and hiking and in the woods and things like that. So, uh, so you, you talked a little bit about um, Emma, but can you tell us a little bit more about her? Um, yeah, because I was just going to say, as a kid, my life was so entwined with Emma that when you ask me about what my life was, and especially when I'm sitting here surrounded by her paintings, it, mm-hmm. it was hard not to bring her life into it. But yeah. um, she had a great sense of humor. It was dry humor. Can't like remember anything in particular, but just that she laughed a lot and she loved to read to us when we were little. Mm-hmm. Um, when we arrived at their house, it was like on a weekday. She'd often come out of her bedroom and she'd pull her um, high chair behind her and sit it at the table there in the dining room. It was kind of like a dining room, living room, and so then we'd all sit down and, and talk and invariably she'd point at some of the newly completed paintings that were sitting somewhere around on the floor leaning up against furniture or the wall and she'd be like well what do you think of that one um should i should i put more trees over there or or should i put more blue make the sky a little more blue or what about if i added a cloud over there would that look better and she was constantly asking us our opinions on it um and other times she would We'd like get in there, talk to Gris Mommy or Miriam for a little bit, and then we'd head into Emma's room, and we'd have to slide. It was a, a small, her bedroom studio, and it was just a small room, so we'd squeeze ourselves and slide in between her high chair and the um, furniture and slip and sit on her bed. She just had a small single bed in there. And we'd sit on there and watch her paint. And again, I, I remember seeing the pencil outlines of a barn, and her asking, well, what do you think of that perspective? Did I get that right? <laughs> and, you know, we'd always look at it. And and it was kind of interesting as I think back how, for her, it was just natural to ask our opinions, even though we were just kids. Mm-hmm. Um, she, she always made us feel important that way. Um, the She loved flowers, and she had lots of African violets and her room on the window ledges and she'd fuss about them and and ask us to like water them or stick her finger in and say oh these are a little dry get some water and water them for me and some of them would just be blooming gorgeously and others she'd try to figure out why they weren't blooming for her (laughs) and like that Um, so yeah we often because the older she got the more stiff her body became and so we'd run little errands for her all the time Oh, so what do you think of the popularity of her paintings? Um, I think it's cool, and honestly, more than that, I don't know what to say because um, I think it's a lot related to people being um, fascinated with like the romanticized version of like Amish Mennonite lifestyle, the simplicity mm-hmm. of it, and and that. But um, yeah, it's cool. Yeah. <laughs> And and for you, when did you realize that she was so popular? Well, that's actually a good question because I, I it made me think, and it was just something I grew up knowing. Um, whenever an older Mennonite, you know, came f- from out of state, they would come to visit family and friends, and they stay for overnight at people's houses, and then people take um, them in the horse and buggy and take them around visiting, and they always stopped at. Study's place to, I mean, to visit, but also, of course, to see Emma's things. And then my aunt Miriam also made like small refrigerator magnets out of felt and sequins and things like that. And so they'd buy some of her things too. But um, it's, I don't know, it was just so such a normal thing that I never really thought about it. Um, mm-hmm. On occasion, we'd hear Emma comment that, oh, yeah, she's painting a picture for these people from New York that stopped in or some other faraway state. And it's like, oh, you know, that was kind of cool. But again, it was just normal. Um, But some years after she had passed away, 
um, I heard that some of her paintings were sold like for a couple hundred dollars, and I was like, wow, that's, you know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, it's like, oh, maybe I should have invested more. But at the same time, um, the paintings I do have, I could never sell them. I mean, yeah. I don't care how many hundreds you <laughs> offer me. They have more meaning than that. I mean, mm -hmm. but um, I think my first actual realization um, came actually just about a year ago. I was at um, Goshen College, hasn't had an exhibit. And I was there, but I kind of went incognito. Nobody knew who I was. And after someone had given a little speech, they were some people were just sitting there kind of having conversations back and forth. And this one woman, just in this like reverent voice, kind of shared, I was at her funeral. And the re response to that comment came as like, this audible exhalation as one breath of like, and the fascination that I could feel in the room was palpable. And I remembered having seen a stranger at um, Emma's funeral service, at the graveside service. And suddenly I realized that to this woman and to these people, the experience of having been at Emma's uh, graveside service or at her house or to have known her was equal to the experience I had when I was in Gaverny, France at Claude Monet's um, home mm -hmm. and I kind of brushed my hands. I reached out. I wasn't really supposed to, but <laughs> I reached out and just touched like the dining room wall. It was a stone wall mm -hmm. and just that feeling of knowing that I had touched a place where Claude Monet had touched yeah. was like this awesome, amazing experience. And to think that that's the way people feel about Emma, that that touches me a lot. Mm -hmm. um, so what are some of your favorite memories of Emma? Um, there's so many memories, it's hard to really just choose a total favorite, but... I do remember like one of my first memories, probably the first one, was I was probably like two or three, maybe four, and Emma was sitting on her high chair, you know, her legs as typically they are kind of stretched out straight. She had her she had this one straight walking cane. And she was holding that out, we were playing tag. And so she sat on the chair and she would wave the stick. And we, my brothers and I were running back and forth between the kitchen and dining room. And, and I just remember that feeling of hollering and screaming and my body curving away from you know, her stick. And um, just that fun of playing with her um, is, a, is a favorite memory, mm -hmm. probably, that I have of her. Okay. Um, so Emma was quite the entrepreneur with selling her, being able to sell her paintings um, outside of the home and things like that. So how was this significant in the Old Order Mennonite Church? Um, well, Old Order Mennonites are very entrepreneurial. Mm -hmm. um, now, granted, it's typically mostly the men, but the women are also, I mean, even though they're very busy with, you know, the, the family, the housework and garden and all that, um, they're still usually frequently involved, depending what their gifting is. If they're really good with money, they might do the finances for the business or um, it's whatever. So women are often involved in helping their husbands with it. Some women will have their own, like, sewing or business or something like that on the side or babysitting. But um, with Emma, it, I think it was more just she was very independent. She was determined to take care of herself. She was not going to allow herself to be um, beholden to other people. And so as she got older, she just found things that she could do, things she was good at, and mm -hmm. did it and sold it. And um, I think it was something that just flowed out of need and out of the giftings that she had. And uh, I, Dick Pletcher has shared what you've written about Emma um, with me. So I've, I've read through that and I, I found it quite interesting um, that she had that dog Skippy that she yeah. placed in her paintings. Um, so was there really anything else that she would put in her paintings? Um, to my knowledge, that was the only thing okay, and that she actually did. Um, what was his significance? 
Well, I know she mentioned him a few times. Her diaries are just kind of like basic facts of old-fashioned diaries of what they did for the day. Mm -hmm. um, I could read in between the lines because I know her and I know most of the people and, you know, the community and like that. But um, she would mention Skippy a few times occasionally in her diary. It's when the farm, she was born on the home farm, which was her, um, had been her, grandpa her um, paternal grandparents' home farm. And it was like several miles north of Wakarusa and then west a little bit. Um, I don't know if it was a half a mile or a mile and a half west. And um, when they lived there, they had this dog named Skippy, a little black and white dog. And because of the fact she put him in her paintings so much, and she did mention him a few times, I think she, it, he meant a lot to her. Mm -hmm. um, but so why they never got another dog, or at least not one that she connected with, I don't know, but I know yeah. that one was special to her. With Emma being like a, a naive um, folk artist, um, kind of in the same green as Grandma Moses, mm -hmm. and um, would you consider Emma like the Grandma Moses of Northern Indiana? Um, I grew up hearing that phrase, and... Um, mm -hmm. I know one of the main differences in their style of art is that Emma, I mean, she started out, you can tell the difference in her art. Her early art was much more detailed, the lines were cleaner, um, and then as time went on and there was such a demand for art, for her work, and she wanted to please everybody, she started doing mass productions of some paintings, and it kind of changed it. I had a conversation with um, someone at a museum one time and they were talking about how they felt like if she would have continued in the way she did the style that she did originally that it would definitely have been comparable to if not even surpassed um, Grandma Moses and um, but because of it he says it, it doesn't hold the same quality but um, to me I think it's more like what each person, it's in each person's heart as to what it means to them. Mm -hmm. And also, I think she's probably the most well-known um, folk artist, naive artist in the Elkhart County area. So, I mean, I guess it could qualify for that. Yeah. Um, so besides her paintings, what are some other items that she created? Um... She used to, like, when she first started out with her entrepreneurial endeavors, um, she used to crochet or she, crochet some things, but, or I don't know if she was crocheting doilies, but she embroidered doilies and like that. And I remember reading in the diary where she was um, sending, like, maybe a package of 10 or 20 of them to Pennsylvania or Virginia, and she just made the comment, well, I guess they like them because they're asking for more. <laughs> and so she was making sure they got shipped off. And so she did that, and she used to string beads for the babies. Mm -hmm. um, they were, like, kind of the transparent colored beads. They're, they're kind of star-like, and they fit into each other, and she would string those beads for babies to play with at church okay. and sell those. Yeah, um, I know. Didn't she also do paint like on plates and? Yeah, that's that's where she with the painting part. She I, I don't really know if she started with wood objects or paint or plates or and other all of different types of glass um, like sugar and creamer and things like that mm -hmm. that she would paint on. She started out by painting like her signature rose um, on things. I don't know if. You have anything with that on it? Yeah, I we do. It, it's in a. You can't, probably Is it can't the plastic see it. heart? Uh, yeah, it's not a plastic, wooden, but wooden heart. Yeah, it's a wooden yeah. heart. Yeah, she did that, and then later I know she painted pictures on, um, on plates and things like that. And then my mom, when um, my mom came from a family who, of people who were artists. I mean, nothing. No, nobody ever got, became well known, but um, she had that gift. And so when she first married my dad, she was painting pictures and sending them off to my dad was working at this factory. And so he would take them to the factory and sell my mom's paintings. And so my mom learned from a Connie Gordon um, do it yourself type book, whatever. And so my mom shared that book with Emma and okay. encouraged her to try doing it on canvas. Okay. 
Mm-hmm. And she said it. Emma at first was like, oh, you, did you think I could do that? And mom's like, well, I can, so <laughs> yeah. I think you could. <laughs> and so that's how she got started doing it on canvas. Yeah, yeah. yeah she started out with oil, and but her um, she had allergic reactions to it really badly with her fingers. And so mm-hmm. when acrylics came out, she switched to acrylics. Yeah. Uh, my, my favorite is our um, the triptych, the three paintings that are together. And there's puff paint used in the flowers oh okay like it's like pink glitter puff paint almost like yeah she did that she experimented with that it was interesting there are different things over the years that she would experiment with mm-hmm. yeah. Yeah. uh so what was you kind of touched on this earlier but what was emma's inspiration for her paintings her life um yeah it's she just she often said um um, I live what I paint, and, or I paint what I see, and I live what I paint. And um, so, yeah, when I look around, these were just everyday life experiences for her. The tripod thing, or the... Uh, uh, the triptych. Uh, triptych, yeah, um, is actually a scene out her window. Okay. Her, um, at my aunt and uncle's farm is one section of it. And, um, but yeah, these are just everyday experiences. Um, many of them... Is still how they lived when I was a kid. Um, a lot of the farming methods have changed, but. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, so I, I just have I just thought of a couple questions while we've been okay. been talking. Um, my my dad is an auctioneer, so he oh, sold okay. a couple Emmas before, and he sent me pictures of them. Um, and there was. We have a fall scene of one, but he's seen a winter one of something similar um, sold. So, um, did Emma have like take her paintings and take the scenes and make them into like different having seasons? Like, did she paint the seasons of like one, um, say like a sugar camp or something like that? She would she would do take the same scene and t- and paint it in different seasons. Yes, because I know um, she has a sugar camp that's winter and another one that's um, is it spring? Because I don't know that she would do a fall scene because sugar, maple sugar would be yeah. So I think that mm-hmm. she did a lot of fall scenes, but yeah, I think it's spring and um, winter. Okay. Yeah, and um, I also heard another story, too, that her brother made a lot of her frames. Um, well, my actually, her nephew, my brother, oh, okay. um, may, at one time made a lot of her frames. Now, I don't know if her brother did. I'm not going to say that he didn't, mm-hmm. but not to my knowledge. I know my, um, my brother did, okay. which would be her nephew. All right. And I had another one, but it just escaped my mind. Was there anything that... We really didn't talk about that you wanted to talk about? Well, um, okay, at one point, my grandparents' barn, um, had they just had a small barn at the place where they were living, and but it was old and it needed to be redone, so um, when they tore it down, they, Emma saved a lot of the pieces of wood, so when you, for some of the wood where it's just a painting a picture on a on wood mm-hmm. some of those are from her barn okay so, yeah. yeah we have we probably have about four of those okay i think of their paintings on like pieces of wood mm-hmm. or there's one that's like this small yeah so um anything else i know um she used to say that she would have preferred just painting nature she loved mm-hmm. nature she loved having picnics in the woods we sometimes when we were kids we'd um, put her on a wagon and put a picnic basket with it and pull her out in the woods and have picnics and she loved nature and that's what she would have preferred but in order to earn a living she had to paint what people wanted so she <laughs> yeah. painted what she knew well thank you so much well thank you for- I enjoyed for doing this with me. Thank you for having me. Yeah, and I really appreciate you. Well, that's all for this episode. A special thank you to Mr. Grant and Alita for joining me and talking more about Emma. Join us next month as we'll have two of Napanee's oldest businesses on the podcast. And before you go, make sure to subscribe to this podcast and hit like or leave us a comment.